given that this is our missional context, uh, the context of racialized society, where the social economic uh, uh, gap is tied to how racialized we are and so forth, what are, what are some things you see as you uh, look at uh, your own congregation as well as congregations around our land? Uh, what are some particular challenges you think these congregations face if they are to really speak into these uh, fragmentations and pains and injustice with the power of the gospel? What, what are the challenges that they face? And again, what are some signs of hopes you see in terms of different communities of faith uh, are really rising to that task? I think we face a challenge in our churches uh, kind of twofold where one, we're not supposed to talk about it. We're supposed to be this post-racial society, colorblind. We also then have what you were describing, Peter, of people feeling like, I've grown up in diversity. Mm-hmm. I've got a handle on this. This thing about racial, whatever, that's ah. from the past. That's the 60s, whatever. Ah. We're, we're, we're beyond that. So you, it's really difficult to address it because you've got those two things both pushing in the same direction, which is mm-hmm. pushing you away from... Uh, actually trying to deal with these issues. Mm -hmm. Then, and and, and think about this irony. So when Barack Obama got elected, the discussion was, first of all, was, is he black enough? Because he's got this white mother. But then it was determined he's black enough. So when he gets elected, then it's this big issue because we have our first black president. And at that moment in which we get our first black president, we use that election to announce we are now post-racial, and this is the final evidence of it. Yet... It was race that we used the entire time to get to that point. Mm. Mm. Um, so this idea of post-racial for me is a real challenge. Because mm. post-racial, when you drill down, tends to mean now we're all white. Or mm. now we're all homogenous. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to talk about our difference. Mm. And I think we know as being Christians, we, we are made differently for a reason. And we're not trying to get rid of our differences. We're mm. trying to figure out how to bring them together to harness them for God's call. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. You know, um, I, I answered this question by uh, my, my 12-year-old, Gabby. I got a text from her probably about a month or two ago. And it, and the text said, Daddy, when did racism end? And she, she was working on this school assignment. <laughs> and so, you know, I called, I called her and I said, what do you mean, when did racism end? She said, when was all that? That, that marches and all that stuff. When did, when did all that happen? When did it all end? And I think that's sort of the, you know, picking back off what you're saying, Michael, that's sort of the, the atmosphere. All that happened before. And we've all arrived now. And so since we've all arrived, we don't need to identify anything. We, we can just be colorblind and just go about our way of doing things. And I think for the church, who are supposed to be people of truth and righteousness, we have to have the moral fortitude to tell the truth about what's happening, about race. Mm -hmm. And the problem there then becomes most people don't know the truth. Mm -hmm. They don't know it because either they're colorblind or they don't want to know it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think first off we have to identify truth when it comes to this area. And then we have to have the courage to call our people, our churches, our Christian institutions to righteousness and say, what does righteousness look like to the scriptures, to systems that oppress us, both individually as well as institutionally? And we have to go through with that. Um, I think uh, it it really is going to be the challenge of pastors in the 21st century as we continue to to diversify demographically. I mean, the day is already here in most communities, but if it isn't in some communities, it's coming really quickly where you you cannot dodge this anymore. Sure. You will not be able to dodge it anymore, and you're going to have to do something with it. So if we respond as people of truth when looking at what ethnicity and race means to America, and as people of righteousness with teaching our people how to live holy within that context, I I think that's the challenge for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Alvin, you frequently have an opportunity to speak to a large group of pastors, given your role in the leadership in our denomination. Do you find when you have that opportunity to tell the truth uh, that you have a responsive audience today? 
um, I have an audience that says this. <laughs> mm. Keep telling me, but I kind of don't want to hear it. Mm. Um, and, and it's not kind of I don't want to hear it because uh, I don't like you, but man, this is just so real. Uh, and so uh, I, I found that uh, there's a growing segment that are opening up more mm. to wanting to do something about it, mm. which has encouraged my heart mm. deeply. Sure. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Aaron, I actually wanted to kind of ask you a, a, a question in terms of your sociological um, study. Because the thing that we found is it's been way easier in some ways to have a multi-ethnic, multiracial community um, that uh, has now within it socioeconomic diversity, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. And I was told early on in this journey that it was going to be easier just because of the age demographic we're reaching out to, to be able to gather a group of folks, diverse group of folks who'd, who'd, who'd meet. But eventually the church will get to a point where we're, if we're really living into the reality and mission of what God has called us to, that poor folks, uneducated folks, were going to show up. Yep. And they're there. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we've got on a given Sunday, you know, a... Uh, 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 an investment banker who has an MBA from Harvard sitting next to a single Puerto Rican mom from the neighborhood. Yeah. So the challenge that we've had is one, obviously, mm. getting these folks to enter into a true meaningful biblical community mm -hmm. and yeah. fellowship, koinonia, what, what scripture talks about in terms of koinonia. Mm. But secondly, also is asking this larger question of it seems to me justice now isn't just about racial reconciliation, mm. but there's this component of socioeconomic yep. right. reconciliation, you know. Yep. And that um, is, is, is challenging. That's hard. That's mm -hmm. difficult, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and we've had some successes mm -hmm. within our congregation mm -hmm. about what it means for us to be a kingdom community that reflects Acts 2 and is radically generous. Mm -hmm. We're seeing signs and glimpses of that. Mm. But when it comes to the larger society, community at large, about how we as a church address that, mm, yeah. you know, as a justice issue now, the socioeconomic disparity is a justice issue that has very close ties with race and ethnicity. Mm. How to go about doing that, mm. that's an enormous challenge. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You know, the church that I, I used to pastor, I still attend now, and just to demonstrate what you just said, mm -hmm. um, at the end of the summer, we had a, a picnic, a church picnic, um, in the local park, and I was talking to one of our young men, young African-American man, he's 21 years old. And he, he pointed to a, to a white guy who was eating a burger. And he mm. said, oh, man, that's the guy who busted me. Wow. <laughs> I said, really? He said, yeah. And so then the, 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 the white guy who was yeah. a cop saw him, and then he came over. Yeah. So, I mean, how many reconciliation paradigms you have going on right there with the racial with sure. the justice with all sure. that but i think the church is the only place where yeah. there's any hope that all that can get absolutely healed absolutely mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, in yeah. some ways uh to muddy the water a little bit more you know how social scientists talk about you really cannot separate race class and gender pieces mm -hmm. they are often very intermingled mm -hmm. uh so as then bring the gender piece in to this whole conversation about yeah. mm -hmm. how do we become a community that do, that does not exclude but include all the folks from this, from different backgrounds in such a way that they feel safe yeah. in being part of the community mm -hmm. that is more and more challenge isn't it um, mm -hmm. and i know in the congregations there's an ongoing theological debate about how to view women in leadership and so forth mm -hmm. but even given those theological convictions be held with a sense of integrity, I think how we can approach gender issue, we could do it in a healthier way. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder if you can comment on, as we think about this biblical notion of justice, how do these variables of race, ethnicity, and then social economic class and gender issues come together and what kind of challenges that create? <laughs> so we often say, you know, I'm gonna focus on ethnicity but you can't in this country do that without also focusing then on socioeconomic inequality. And you can't do that, as we know, without focusing on gender. Gender is 
our poverty is very gendered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The worst thing to be by far is a single female with a child. Mm -hmm. the, the percent that are in poverty is incredible. Mm -hmm. So they, they, these are complicated issues that the church faces because that's what society is giving to us. Mm -hmm. But I love what you said, which is the question is, what, what are we doing to include rather than exclude? And when we make a decision to exclude, on what basis do we? Mm. When is it theologically justifiable to exclude? And when it's not, then we sh are focusing our attention on making sure people feel included. Mm -hmm. And that's different than saying, you're welcome mm. yeah. to come here. It's yeah. a very different task. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, in some ways, you are welcome to come here is sort of creating a category of we're the hosts and you're the guests, yep. right? You're temporarily welcome So then you here. are not in truly included. Then. Included. Yeah. 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 How do we become such a congregation where all people who are others come together and say, I'm equally invested here. I am a valued member of this family. How do you go from that language of hospitality to true inclusion, you think? I always illustrate saying you have to be welcome and invited. Because you can be welcome but not invited. Ah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been a tag along at parties where I didn't know anybody, but one person, you know, the person says, hey, come to this party with me. And I go to the party. You don't know any of the inside jokes. You don't know any of the context. You don't know anything. And you're there and everybody's cordial to you. Mm -hmm. But nobody is really interacting with you mm -hmm. on a deep level mm -hmm. because you're still an outsider, even though you're welcome. Mm -hmm. And I think we, you know, the charge that I give to our churches is, is your community welcome and invited? Because mm. no church in their right mind is going to say, well, you're not welcome mm. in our church. Mm. Uh, or we have to question whether you're a church if you're going <laughs> to say nobody's welcome. Mm. So everybody's going to at least mentally assent to say we're welcome. Mm. My charge is, yeah, but are they invited? Mm. Do you actually want them there? Mm. Yeah. And what are you doing mm. to, to make sure that they know and understand mm. that they are, their human dignity is, is worthy and you care about them, regardless of their, their background. Yeah. And, you know, in our congregation, uh, along with some of the more practical, tangible things, I think, uh, I think it's a constant reminder to the congregation that the ultimate example of someone who was an other and yet was welcome and invited mm -hmm. was God, mm. Christ, mm -hmm. you know, in relationship to mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And un unless and until that, I think, begins to work in our hearts, I mean, truly in a profound way that we were the ultimate other enemies of God, and yet by the cross and resurrection, we were welcomed and invited in the truest sense of the word. Um, and the human heart's not going to naturally have the impetus to go to the person that looks different, acts different, so on and so forth, and say, hey. And so that's one of the things uh, I know that I've had to constantly work on in my own heart and mm -hmm. the hearts of our congregation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a constant reminder, constant mm -hmm. reminder, you know, um, to be looking out and to, to ask the question of what it is that God has done for us. And so what does it mean for us to do that for others? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Now, three of you have been championing this cause of uh, ministry of reconciliation, ministry that embraces others into diversity, I think behind that is also a personal story, how yeah. this journey began for you. And I'm wondering if you could briefly share that road to Damascus experience, <laughs> if there was such a one, how, how you got into this hard journey uh, that is compelling, but it comes with cost. Uh, how did it begin for you? I'll let you start. Okay. Well, I have uh, a two uh, major experiences that happened, and one of them kind of surreal because the person that caused the surreal experience to happen is, is sitting right there. And he doesn't even know. <laughs> but the, the first uh, Damascus Road experience was I was introduced to a book called Divided by Faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, a friend of mine told me, oh, you got to read this book. You got to read this book. And I was a church planter in inner city Cincinnati mm -hmm. trying to start a, a multiracial, multisocial class, multi-everything church. And I said, yeah, I read this book. And I literally started reading it and did it, didn't put it down for three days. Mm. And I read it. And when I closed the book, I'll never forget. I said, that's it. Mm. I said, that's it. That what, that's what has to happen. That's what needs to 
to occur in order for us um, to be able to be an authentic community of God. Mm -hmm. So I thank you for writing that book mm -hmm. because that was a, a yeah. tremendous Damascus Road experience. The other one was um, a few short months later after us starting our church, we uh, experienced in Cincinnati a mini race riot for five days mm -hmm. in the neighborhood mm -hmm. that I uh, planted in. It was called Over the Rhine. A young African-American man by the name of Timothy Thomas was, was shot dead by a white police officer. Mm -hmm. It was the 15th killing of a young African-American man by the Cincinnati Police Department over a five-year period, and the neighborhood literally uh, started rioting over, rioting over mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So this was in the very neighborhood that God called me to plant the church. Wow. Um, and in fact, it was the launch week of our church. It was the week where we were announcing to the world that we were starting our first public services. Mm. Mm. Happened during that whole <laughs> week. And I'm a proud Trinity grad, but you guys did teach me how to handle that. <laughs> but it was a great journey of truly seeking the Lord praying, fasting, mm -hmm. reading the scriptures, trying stuff, let them blow up, trying other stuff, see them succeed, because the entire city was talking about these issues, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. what's happened to our beloved city? And so uh, both of those, both reading of the book and working in that context for seven years as a pastor of River of Life Church mm -hmm. uh, really shaped who I am today as a believer in Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. Well, my, my story begins with uh, coming to the country uh, when I was 10 years old. My parents immigrated to the U.S. when I was 10 years old. And so, uh, you know, my first few years uh, in this country was pretty rough <laughs> as an yeah. immigrant uh, child. Um, I had to learn a brand new language, get accustomed to new culture, so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, that in a lot of ways very much shaped, if you will, my perspective of America. Mm. And... Uh, parents immigrated into the city and so I was in an incredibly diverse neighborhood um, and so my, my, my initial very formative years of America was urban and multi-ethnic mm -hmm. and so that's the environment which I feel most comfortable and so if, in some ways for me a uh, journey back to the city with my wife and, and our children to plant this church was a call back home if you will um, mm. I think another ministry experience that uh, shaped kind of my heart for multi-ethnicity and, and a desire to see a multiracial kingdom community was um, I was working, I had been working at a Korean American church uh, for most of my ministry years. And Peter, I, I, I don't know if you remember this, um, Peter actually gave a project for one of his classes and it was to do this demographic sociological analysis and, uh, and come up with a, a, a project for it. And, and I've been working at a Korean church, and, and God had, you know, continually been growing my heart for multi-ethnic, multiracial ministry. And during a staff meeting, one day, uh, you know, I raised my hand, and we're just discussing our church's mission and issues. And, and I said to everybody on staff, I said, I have just got to ask this question. So we're spending like ten, fifteen thousand dollars to send ten Korean college kids to Oaxaca, Mexico. And I'm like, well, I'm all about missions. I'm all about global overseas missions. But I said, I've been, I've been studying our community. And there are like 7,000 Mexican folks who live within like 5, 10 minute radius of where we worship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have zero relationship with any of these folks. I, mean, I just said, is that, is that a problem to anybody else? You know? <laughs> <laughs> <No>, soon, shortly <laughs> let go and fired, probably fired. From, no, they didn't fire yeah. me. But... I mean, th that was just a question that I asked, which is, we have all of these folks literally within walking distance from where we worship. What does it mean for us as a community, church community, to be hospitable, to be welcoming, to be inclusive mm -hmm. of these folks yeah. right around us? And so, you know, that in some ways very much kind of propelled this journey for the next two, three years of asking, what does it mean for me? If I'm going to pastor a church to be in a community or a neighborhood that will be welcoming to literally anybody, mm -hmm. anybody just walk in and feel at home and feel welcomed and embraced. And so those are sort of two yeah. in terms of experiences, formative experiences that began my journey. Absolutely. Powerful. I, uh, I shared this with some students earlier today, but 
I was living as a middle class white person would do it to the utmost in every decision I made, including where we lived and where I would send my children to school and uh, how I chose to spend money. Um, a little later, after we had some changes, we looked at when we would send out Christmas letters to people. We would like write a letter, here's what our family did this past year, and send it out. And uh, Every single person we knew was white. Mm -hmm. So we lived a very, very homogenous life. Mm -hmm. uh, we went, I got invited to a Promise Keepers event in the mid-90s, and it just fundamentally transformed me. Mm -hmm. and it didn't matter what the speaker said. What I heard was, race matters. I grieve over race. You need to join in this changing this evil. And it's made no sense to me at all. I was always of the issue race was of the past, and there's a few complainers over there. I don't know what they're complaining about. And so I just felt a, like a Pentecost, like tongues of fire came on me. Mm. Like God picked me up by the throat, put me on a surfboard, glued my feet, and away I went. I stood, stayed awake for 72 hours straight. I read every book I could possibly find on race and religion. Mm. It was like this whole new world to me. And, mm. and in that, um, came back, and uh, my wife was five months pregnant at the time, and I got a clear word from God. God doesn't usually talk to me. He's got more important things to do, but this time <laughs> God did. <laughs> and... So I said to my wife, I said, you might want to sit down because I've got to tell you about some life changes that I know God's going to do. I don't know how and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Just that we're going to do them. So I said, we're going to, I'm going to get a new job somehow. We're going to move to a place where we're the minority. We're going to send our children to a school where they're the minority. We're going to go to a, a church where we're the minority. Mm -hmm. Wow. And again, like I didn't know why, what we, why, but... And, uh, you know, my wife looked at me, and then she just burst into tears, wrote me a long letter about that night um, saying, I, I don't understand. You know, I trust that God can speak to you, but he hasn't spoken to me. Mm. I don't understand. I, I wonder if you're just taking this too far because of this conference you were at or something, and you should give it some time, see if it'll pass. Well, so meanwhile where my wife went to college and a job opening comes up and it describes exactly what I do, mm. everything. So I knew that was the job and that was what God was gonna do. It would move us to Minneapolis, St. Paul area. And through connections and through extreme turmoil and mm. uh, even marital issues, we ended up moving and sending our children and worshiping just as God had said would happen. Mm. There was a lot of miracles along the way and it was because we were in the midst of that, going through culture shock, at the same time, we were interviewing evangelicals around the country. Mm. And Divided by Faith was written because of what I was hearing, but because of this change of life God was having us go through wow. as well. That I would hear in a different way when people spoke. I see. Mm -hmm. So Divided by Faith as a book came out of, came out of that, that wow. period wow. of your life, mm. yes. where it was not just a purely sociological analysis that led you to it, mm. but your own life experiences and faith experiences yes. converged together into writing of that book. Yep. No wonder that book has such a powerful impact yes, on yeah. so yeah. many people. Yeah. We don't get to hear that personal story <laughs> no. reading that. Wow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly came with a cost for you and initially yeah. in your marriage as well. Yeah. It was interesting is that it was marital difficulties all through it. It didn't just like go away as soon as we made the move. It was, mm. But um, when the book came out, Christianity Today had it as its cover story and, and it, we subscribed to Christianity Today and my wife got it first and she just broke down weeping realizing this is why God did what he did. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it was big. Wow. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, for me, um, my road to Damascus experience was Los Angeles riot, mm. April of 1992. Wow. I was uh, serving in a Korean American PCUSA church at that time and serving as a university staff worker during the weekdays. And when that thing blew up, all of us were caught off guard, but particularly Korean Americans. Mm -hmm. I think Korean Americans, as recently arrived immigrant community members, Race relations is all about black and white. Mm -hmm. And we get to sit out on this one. <laughs> we do our own ethnic ministry thing, and there's larger issues. They're not part of us. Well, as you know, 
at least the initial part of the, how the L.A. civil unrest unraveled. The Korean Americans were part of that player. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and so when the L.A. town burned down, or Korea town burned down in L.A., um, I saw my congregant members and pastoral staff members immediately jumping with a sort of a knee-jerk reaction of, we need to pray for our, our co-ethnic folks, Korean-American merchants who are losing all their belongings and so forth. Uh, but then after that season had uh, passed, there was absolutely no response coming theologically or biblically about what just happened. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. How did this happen? And what should be our Christian response to this? And that certainly brought us into now a whole conversation about race. This was 1992. Uh, there was not divided by faith. In fact, I don't think at that time any evangelical publishers, including mm. in the varsity press, had any books mm. that talked about how to think Christianly about the issues of race and social economic uh, inequality and so forth. And, uh, and like you, Alvin, I look back my seminary notebooks. <laughs> there was a gaping hole yeah. in the social ethics. Mm. Our Christian ethics covered well our individual choice making. Mm. And then from there, you go to the macro level of a just war theory. Mm. Mm. And a complete absent was the middle category of how do we treat our neighbors, especially yeah. if they are different than who you are, as Jesus used in the Good Samaritan parable. Mm. And that prompted me mm. to be on this journey of how to think about not only issues of race, but also justice and how does it uh, connect with our biblical faith. So in some ways, God uses all these personal circumstances mm. to shape us who you are so we can serve his church. Mm. That's exciting. Yeah. Now, as so many of you may have heard, uh, many sociologists who particularly look at the demographic patterns, um, they point out that somewhere around 2042, uh, the demographic shift would be happening in our land in such a way that the whites would no longer be numerical majority of this society. And uh, for a certain younger age group, that reality is already here in some yeah. ways. Mm -hmm. um, how should church leaders look at this changing of our mission field in terms of demographics? Uh, uh, and from what you hear and see, uh, do these demographic changes have any impact on how pastors thinking about? Uh, I got to rethink about my sort of missiological lens of how we do ministry of the gospel in this place. What do you think? Is it panic? Is it, <laughs> <laughs> is it more sense of excitement? Uh, well, if pastors truly want to reach the mission field and Christian institutions, if we say we want to reach America, which I think the last thing I read were the third largest mission field in the world, hmm. then you cannot ignore the racial demographics as well as the social class issues and those types of things. And I think we need to um, not pretend that we are just theological beings, so to be, so to speak. But we're people of theology and social and cultural values, attitudes, and beliefs. And we've got to find where those things intersect and create churches and theologies that speak to the human condition, mm -hmm. not just the white human condition or just the black human condition or just the Asian or the Hispanic human condition, but the human condition, period. Because if we can master theologically, socially, and culturally uh, engaging the human condition, then that's when we can truly proclaim and demonstrate the gospel of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. to anybody in whom we come across. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I heard a uh, theologian named J. <clears throat> J. Cameron Carter from Duke mm -hmm. who said that we have to think about the church as how can it be a tonic? that addresses what is happening in society. So if we are diversifying, then we have to make this an absolute core of who we are as a church and how we're going to meet the needs of people to draw them in. Uh, and he actually uh, says that we need a, uh, he calls it a fugitive theology, a theology that's against itself in a way. Like we've kind of created theologies that are almost racially based out of the common experiences and 
what we should emphasize and what makes most sense and what God really meant to say here. We're going to actually have to, in this diversity, create a new theology that will speak to us all, that people will hear and feel welcomed and invited and included. So it's a challenge of the work of what's happening at divinity schools, seminaries, and in the local parishes and congregations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, in Ephesians 2, when Paul talks about God breaking down the dividing wall of hostility and creating one new humanity, mm-hmm. some scholars and commentators talk uh, about how that literally it translates to one new human race, a new race of people. Um, I think the church has to proclaim and demonstrate what a new race of people looks like. Yeah, Mm -hmm. that's right. You know, because the reality is when when, when 2040 rolls around and you look out, it's going to be an incredibly diverse ethnically and culturally, so on and so forth, racially, a country. But the question that's going to be asked is, in light of everything that you mentioned, is there a whole new way of doing everything together that reflects God's kingdom? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's, essentially the mission of the church going forward, you know. Um, and the challenge is going to be thinking out the implications of that, economically, socially, culturally, racially. Um, and I think it will involve addressing issues of socioeconomic disparities. It will involve issues of gender. I mean, it will also, given my uh, history, uh, involve issues of what is the Christian response to immigration? Mm-hmm. That's going to be enormous. It's going to be enormous. And, you know, for me personally, I'm a, I'm a little disappointed in the lack of response from the church, frankly. Yeah. You know? We're very quiet. We're though. very <laughs> quiet. We're very quiet, you know? Uh, or even worse yet, the loudest voices are, it seems to be sort of the two extreme voices. Yeah. yeah. You know? And... Uh, and, and the immigration is only going to continue. It's only going to intensify. And they're here. They're going to be here. What does it mean for the church to embrace them? In some ways, um, it being identified as a Hispanic issue yes. is very unfortunate. Right. Yep. And it's Peter, not. you and I are immigrants. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and Absolutely. our church communities, our people in our Asian American communities also need to speak up on this issue. They do. Yeah.